All right, here's how it begins. Here's how the book begins. The chapter is called, As He Died, He Saw Your Face. I sat in a mountain lodge one weekend with 200 junior high students. We'd embarked on three days of wholesome fun and getting jazzed for God. The editor actually wanted to pull out the getting jazzed for God part. And <laughs> seriously, and I'm like, every youth pastor or former youth pastor who reads this is to be like, no, I know exactly what it means to get jazzed for God. We'd embarked, uh, oh yeah, uh, I was 24. A part-time youth pastor, working my way through seminary, I'd taken a job at an evangelical church near campus. I had driven a van load of students into the Southern California mountains for a winter weekend at the denomination's retreat center. We met up with busloads of kids converging from several churches in the region, and the air was laden with anticipation, no doubt driven as much by hormones as by spiritual curiosity. Such is evangelical youth ministry. On Friday, the highly touted and charismatic speaker for the weekend gave a talk in the evening chapel service that endeared him to all of the kids. He told funny stories about himself in middle school and how nerdy he was, and he set himself up as a credible authority on spiritual matters. Then, on Saturday night, he brought the heat. He told us a long, detailed story about a poor peasant woman in Russia who lived with her toddler daughter in a dismal Soviet-era apartment. They had a horrible life, he told us, but at least they had each other. Then one night, as they were sleeping, the shoddy communist construction gave way during an earthquake, and the building collapsed on top of them. The mother was pinned beneath a huge piece of concrete. Miraculously, the young girl was unharmed, but they were both trapped in the rubble with no way of escape. A day passed, but no one came to their rescue. The little girl began to grow weak, and she complained to her mother that she was hungry and thirsty. Another day passed, and the mother began lapsing in and out of consciousness. She knew that her young child would die of dehydration soon if she didn't do something. On the third day, <laughs> the mother realized she was going to have to make a sacrifice for her daughter. So she reached out for a piece of broken glass and she slashed open her palm and directed her daughter to drink her blood in order to survive. The girl did as she was told and she was rescued. The mother died. We were on the edge of our seats. What love this mother had to sacrifice herself for her daughter. Who doesn't want to be loved like that? Now the speaker was worked up into a metaphorical lather, and his voice rose as he addressed the assembled 11 and 12-year-olds, turning the rhetorical corner from the Russian mother to Jesus. Jesus is like the Russian mother, he told us, and we are the helpless little girl. Jesus' blood on the cross saves us the same way that the daughter was saved. Then the speaker explicated at length the ancient practice of execution by crucifixion. He went into excruciating detail about the pain of having spikes pounded through your wrists and ankles, about the enormous amount of blood, about the humiliation of hanging naked six feet in the air, and about how death comes slowly and agonizingly, not by blood loss, but by suffocation. We heard about the extreme agony, even desperation felt by a victim of crucifixion as he pulled himself up on the spikes in his arms and pushed himself up on the spike in his legs to catch a breath until completely exhausted. He couldn't rise anymore, unable to inhale, coughing, choking, dying. And now our speaker was screaming, sweating, spitting, that's how much Jesus loves you, he cried. He died for you in the most horrible, gruesome manner that the Romans could imagine. And as he died, he saw your face. He whispered your name because you are a sinner. He had to die in your place. God hated you because of your sin. When he looked at you, all he saw was your sin. But Jesus, 
stood between you and God. And now when God looks at you, he only sees Jesus. Tonight you can accept what Jesus did for you and go to heaven instead of hell when you die. You can let Jesus stand between you and the terrifying holy God. Tonight you have the chance to drink the blood from Jesus' hands to save yourself. And the next part I remember verbatim. He concluded, If tonight for the first time you've decided to accept what Jesus did for you, angels are celebrating in heaven. Stay after chapel to pray with a counselor. If tonight you've decided to recommit your life to Jesus, angels are dancing and cheering. You should also stay after and talk to a counselor. And if you aren't ready to do either of those things, you are dismissed. There's popcorn and hot chocolate for you in the dining hall. (laughs) 